thank you everybody for coming and welcome. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, first my uh, colleague here, Roni Rosenfeld, who is a faculty of machine learning at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, myself, my name is Ryan Tipperani. I'm a faculty in statistics and machine learning at the same university. And we are the two leads of the Delphi group based out of Carnegie Mellon. So we're going to give a talk today on a project that our group started um, right when the pandemic began, essentially, which we're calling COVIDcast. And Roni's going to take it away. I'm going to share my screen. All right, thank you, Ryan. First, let me say uh, thank you for um, having me here. I feel very honored to be in the center of uh, an outbreak of deep Shiranis. Um, I'm going to talk about the joint work of our group, uh, Delphi uh, Research Group. It, as, as Ryan mentioned, we uh, <clears throat> established this group um, back in uh, 2012, uh, Ryan and I. And um, uh, Ryan, if you can move to the next uh, next slide, I'll give you a very brief sort of historical setting. Um, <clears throat> the mission of our group is to develop the theory and practice of epidemic forecasting and its role in decision making. And by decision making, we mean both public decision making and private decision making. So the, uh, <clears throat> the um, um, uh, analog we saw or the example we saw of weather forecasting was very much on our, on our mind. Um, we have been participating in the annual um, uh, CDC flu forecasting challenges since 2013. Uh, this has been a, a, um, a program, this is a program that has been growing every year and the most recent year it took place, there were 40 submissions. There I think were only seven or nine in the first year, so it was quite a a growth and we're very proud that we have done very well. In fact, we won the top places in, uh, in most of these years. Uh, in 2019, our group was awarded the CDC National Center of Excellence for Flu Forecasting together with one other um, such center in the country. And we've been uh, committed to supporting them in this uh, uh, forecasting activity since then. And right from the very beginning, uh, our work has always been um, open code, open data, um, creating and sharing uh, tools and uh, databases of uh, epidemiological data. So much of our mindset is not just developing the technology and the tools, but also uh, uh, making it uh, useful to others, to other researchers and to practitioners. So this was then. And um, when the pandemic hit, um, we have um, refocused our attention on COVID. So most of our work was on flu before with some work also on chikungunya, dengue and norovirus. Uh, with the pandemic starting in, in February, we've stopped all of that and focused all our attention on, on COVID. Uh, and also we grew dramatically during this time. We had an outpouring of, um, of offers of help and volunteers uh, from within Carnegie Mellon, but also from outside it. We added lots of very smart folks to, uh, uh, from both within and outside. We have uh, people who join us from, from Stanford, UC Davis, uh, in Southern California, as well as Google. Um, whereas before our focus was on um, forecasting and what is needed in order to, to do forecasting, we were now blessed with having a, a large community of people who are doing forecasting and what we felt was in shortest supply was not surprisingly perhaps data. So much of our attention was focused on providing data, not only for our own forecasting activity, but uh, for the forecasting activity of the whole community. And in fact, for the situational awareness capabilities of, um, of everybody, uh, public health officials, data journalists, uh, general public and so forth. We've realized quickly, uh, maybe a word before you switch, we've realized quickly that um, the data, uh, together with uh, just about everybody else on the planet, that uh, data um, is a big problem in this pandemic, that the availability of high quality, comprehensive, uh, geographically detailed data is very far from where it should be. So um, we um, tried to uh, sort of plug these holes as best we could, and maybe it's time to switch to the next slide. Um, we like to uh, 
present our data uh, the way it relates to the famous um, severity pyramid. So this is a pyramid we use in, in epidemiology in general, and, you, and specifically for COVID, you can think of the over data and, and, and um, sort of detailed information regarding the whole population or regarding only the infected people in the population or only the subset who are symptomatic, the subset who uh, have reached out to the uh, healthcare uh, sector to, to get help. So that's called the medically attended. Uh, that could be an outpatient visit, a test, hospitalization, ICU, and so forth. Um, the thing to notice about the pyramid here is that as you move up the pyramid, um, the, the signals become more specific. Uh, it's easier to know if someone is hospitalized with COVID in principle, whereas if you're further down, like symptomatic, it's a much less specific signal. It picks up a lot of other things. Um, on the other hand, uh, the further down you are, the more the signal is a leading signal uh, relative to uh, sort of the, the overall activity of the pandemic. Whereas as the other extreme, if you look at uh, people who died of COVID, uh, it's uh, very important information, but it's a very lagging uh, signal. So we, we try to spend this entire spend from more, less, less specific to more specific from leading to lagging. And what you see overlaid on the pyramid are the different data sources that we are using. Um, the red is the, those that were, we developed ourselves through our um, uh, through interactions with the healthcare industry, with, uh, with Google, with Facebook, uh, with, with other providers. Uh, the blue are the ones that have been developed by other people, but that we have, um, for the convenience um, of our users, mirrored in our database, as well as provided important versioning, uh, version control and versioning of the data and archiving. So the goal is to be a one-stop one shop for, uh, for all this data, and then of course to use it ourselves. Let me focus here on two uh, important sources of information that uh, I think Ryan will touch on later. One is the massive surveys especially the one that is continuing to run now via uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, Facebook is um, uh, promoting our survey on their platform. And as a result, uh, we, we re receive a tens of thousands of completed surveys every day from throughout the US. The second one is insurance claims information that is provided to us by Change Healthcare and other providers uh, covering uh, about 50% of the US population. Ryan. This is the um, overall ecosystem that we have been developing. Um, at the bottom is uh, our, the data that we are able to get from our very generous partners. So I mentioned Google, uh, I mentioned uh, Facebook. Uh, Google has uh, also contributed uh, a variety of data sources, uh, uh, a, um, a survey of a different type. Um, Google symptom uh, uh, interface that they've uh, developed specifically uh, around COVID. I mentioned Change Healthcare as the main provider of our um, medical claims information. Um, Cardell is a uh, company that uh, produces um, diagnostic tests uh, and have been sharing their data, both flu data and COVID data with us for a while now. And SafeGraph is probably familiar to everybody providing mobile mobility information. We extract um, many signals from each one of these sources and put them into a database of what we call COVID indicators. So the extraction process is non-trivial. We need to make sure that the signals are informative, uh, that they're available at the finest geographic uh, level and that they are uh, operational, that they are available up to the most recent time with the least latency. Um, they include, as I mentioned, both the public sources and all the data revisions. So one thing we found that uh, is critical for modeling and for forecasting is to know what level of revision of the data is available at any time relative to uh, the reference state. So to make it concrete, uh, if we keep track of how many cases were ascertained um, on a given date, we might know a rough approximation of that uh, five days later but we may have a better approximation of it six days later and better yet 10 days and 20 days and 30 days. And data, the data keeps getting updated sometimes many weeks. Uh, and since our forecasts are supposed to operate in real time, they will not have access to the most accurate 
uh, to the most revised data, they will have access to the data as available at that time. So we need to make sure our models are trained on the appropriate level of revision. And that is uh, made possible by the sort of uh, keeping track of the data revisions. On top of the database, we have a public API. We make all the data available uh, and served uh, publicly. Um, and um, we also have uh, both R and, um, uh, and uh, Python packages to um, access the data, plot it and process it. Ryan will show examples. And beyond that, we have interactive maps and graphics that visualize the most salient of these signals. And we have our backend group of people who work on, uh, on building short-term forecasts, nowcast, and hotspot detection. Um, at this point, I'd like to uh, transfer the, um, the baton to Ryan to continue. Let me just mention that uh, we don't have time to cover everything we want to cover here. Specifically, if you have questions about medical claims data or about the details of forecasting or nowcasting, we'd be able to take them. We'll be happy to take them during the Q and A. Ryan, back to you. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, I'm going to jump in for a sec. Go ahead. So sorry, sorry, my my internet went out of, around two minutes before the talk. So I, I'm I'm Rob Tipsharani, the moderator. Uh, I had a little intro, but by now you've already met Ryan and Rose Roni, who I know very well. Uh, I just want to say I I did a short sabbatical at Carnegie Mellon in 2014, and I was a member of the the, the, the Delphi project at that point, which was very small, about six people, very successful, and I could not have imagined what it was going to evolve into in 2020, and that's what you're going to see today. So now, again, I don't know what was said at the beginning, but the plan is to have a half hour talk, uh, send questions during the Q&A during the half hour, and then we'll have a nice half hour of question and answer with Ryan Ramoni for the second half. So take it away, Ryan. Thanks. Um, I'm going to try to finish in 20 minutes. So we'll go maybe to 1235, a little bit over the half hour budget. Um, I just wanted to try to give some details on our API. Um, I'm going to dive into our symptom survey a little bit that is um, in, that we run in partnership with Facebook, and then I'll finish with a small forecasting demo. I'll just reiterate what, what Roni said, which is um, I, we would love to field questions on you know, other parts of the ecosystem um, that was you know, shown on this previous slide, um, like, for example, any of the modeling work, now casting, forecasting. Um, the medical claims data, which is an incredibly important data source to us, we just don't have time to fit that into the talk. So if people are curious, we're happy to talk about it afterwards. Um, and I want to highlight that this talk is reproducible. Um, the slides will be put up very soon at the link that's shown in the footer of the talk. Uh, they currently fail to, to upload minutes before the talk because the talk was a bit too large. But I'll compress it and upload it as soon as the talk is finished. So um, here's a, uh, basically just an overview of the API that we built. This actually was built um, back in 2016 in a bit of a broader context to support flu surveillance streams by one of our PhD students, David Farrow, who's now graduated. Um, and we kind of uh, expanded on it and, and specialized, um, developed a specialized endpoint point for COVID. So, this is an API that um, takes kind of standard HTTP GET queries and um, requires the following parameters to be specified. Data source, signal, time type, geotype, time values, and geo value. And the data source refers to um, the essentially the data partner that we work with in order to create an indicator. For example, it could be doctor visits for the medical claims indicators or Facebook survey for the survey that we run in partnership with Facebook. Signal is, an, is the name of the indicator or the signal, we use those synonymously, that we derive from the data source. So from each one of the data sources, we could extract multiple signals. For example, from our survey through Facebook, we currently have, I think, somewhere approaching 10 unique signals with um, you know, possibility for many, many more, like another easily another 20 um, are available based on the raw data. And these are somewhat self-explanatory, um, just specify, you know, uh, Kind of you know different dimensions that we want to be um, the length which we're looking at the data. So the easiest way to access the API, um, at least for most people who I think are part of the data science community, is through R and Python packages that we that we built around them. And so I'll just highlight um, 
kind of very broadly what they look like. Uh, they're designed to make the API querying very easy because they have many default parameters built in. And I'll give you several examples of that in the slides to come. Um, they provide full support for data revisions, which is an extremely important um, aspect to pay attention to uh, for any kind of operational modeling, now casting or forecasting, hotspot prediction. All of these problems require close attention to revisions. And I'll give you an example of that uh, also a bit later. And the packages have other features like you know, some basic tools for signal processing, some basic graphics tools. Um, we have other packages that support more advanced statistical modeling. I won't be talking about them uh, in this talk, but again, I'm happy to field questions on if people are curious. And all of our work to the full extent that we can is, is public. Um, and so for example, these are in Python packages that are on our public GitHub repo. And if you have an idea, um, we'd love to hear from you by, you know, if you want to file an issue or even con contribute a pull request. So here's some very basic demos of um, how data access is easy through our API and through the, the COVID cast R package that we built. So I'm going to basically walk down the severity pyramid from the top rung to the bottom rung. And I'm going to give you an example of a data source or rather an indicator that lives um, at that rung and how we could access it from our API. So let's suppose I was interested in knowing how many COVID-19 deaths have been reported per day in my state, which is Pennsylvania, since March 1st. This is just a few lines of code. This just and this is all the code I'm going to show in the talk is in R. But again, I'll just repeat that there's a Python package that has equivalent functionality, if, if that's more um, your flavor. So I just have to basically specify um, the data source signal start and end days that I want state level data rather than, for example, county level data, and that I want data only for Pennsylvania through this function COVID cast signal. This will, if you have an internet connection um, that's active, then fetch data from the API and bring it into memory. And plotting it is just, again, one line of code with, uh, you know, here I added a couple of ggplot layers to make the plot look a bit nicer. And so we see um, this is actually seven day average um, reported deaths, a seven day trailing average. It's kind of a basic time series smoother. And we see the dynamics, right, that um, Pennsylvania was, was initially hit in, uh, in May, and now the death toll is rising frighteningly high um, in, the, in the most recent wave in Pennsylvania. So how about hospitalizations? Um, so hospitalization data up until um, a couple of weeks ago was not available on public record in um, really any fine geographic resolution uh, through public health reporting. Then the HHS re released amazing hospitalization data um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, we have access to, in our API, to another source of hospitalization data that's made possible through um, partnership with Change Healthcare and other, um, other providers, um, or rather I should say other data providers. Um, and here I'm showing um, what percentage of daily hospital admissions. So this is a, an indicator we compute based off of uh, medical insurance claims. Um, are due to COVID-19 in Pennsylvania, New York, and Texas, and comparing the three of them. And again, you can see that these three states had kind of different dynamics over the course of the pandemic. New York was very was hit very, very hard in the first wave in, uh, in April, May. Um, Texas was hit much harder in the second wave, and now all three states are seeing an uptick right now. Um, another Another indicator as we walk down the severity pyramid, um, this is probably the one that, that is the most widely discussed, you know, let's say in data journalism or in basic data science projects about COVID-19, which is confirmed cases. Um, and here I'm showing a, ch a choropleth map of, or heat map of um, the current case rate. So this is cases per capita uh, at the most recent day available, which was uh, yesterday from our API nationwide. And so the darker colors indicate higher case rates, higher um, number of uh, new daily confirmed cases. Again, this is a seven day trailing average. Um, and we can see that for example, um, I think this is Tennessee and in our state, Pennsylvania, this is Indiana are particularly hard, are, are, are experiencing you know, heavy burden in terms of reported cases uh, right now. Cumulative case rate is just a different indicator. So it just requires us you know, pulling a different signal from, uh, from the API and we get a very different picture. We see the Midwest um, has had a you know, particularly um, noticeable cumulative burden as well as the South. And one point to make, which is um, 
that we, we use the standard for these, these rates, which is number of cases per 100,000 people in the population. So if you look carefully at the, um, at the, the legend here, the dark red is about 6,000, 6,000 uh, cumulative cases per 100,000 people, or about 6%. And so it's, it's actually quite startling to, to, to look at this map and to realize that 6% of the underlying population has tested positive in this pandemic, um, you know, cumulatively at some point in time in, in the areas that are dark red. 6% is, is, is a pretty huge number. So moving down, um, now I'm going to the, uh, the outpatient visits rung below, below ascertained cases. Um, and here I'm showing how some cities compare in terms of doctor's visits due to COVID-like illness. So this is another indicator that we, that we compute based on um, access to de-identified medical claims made possible through change healthcare and others. And uh, this is an example of an indicator that could not be found anywhere else. This is um, something that would only be available through our API because medical claims indicators or medical claims data, I should say, um, are, you know, are, are essentially never made public record. Um, and we see here's uh, New York City, again, had, had a very um, kind of significant activity in the first wave in April, May. This is San Antonio, uh, which has you know, different characteristics. It's showing that this, the second wave being hit um, particularly hard. Pittsburgh is in blue and Miami is in red. And something very peculiar happened where they, they essentially all of these spike um, at the end of November. I'm wondering if anybody knows why that would be the case. I guess it's kind of hard for me to solicit. This is something I usually like to do in talks is to solicit ideas from the audience, but it's kind of hard to do on Zoom. Um, I will, how about this? I will wait to tell you until the question and answer period. People can think about why would a why would the percentage of doctor visits due to COVID-like illness have a spike in late November that then comes back down? Um, it, this looks like there must be something going on and we can talk about it uh, you know, in the Q&A period. Um, and the last one, or actually the second to last one is symptoms. So this is another indicator that would not be available anywhere else. This is based on our survey that we disseminate through the help of Facebook, which we'll talk about in more detail later. Um, here I'm comparing how my county, which is Allegheny County, uh, in, in red, in my, my friend's county, which is uh, Fulton County in blue. I think that's right. Although to me, this actually looks backwards. I think I may have gotten the, the color labels wrong. Um, yeah, I think I got the color labels wrong here. So I'm sorry. Allegheny County should be in blue and Fulton County should be in red. Uh, because I know that our county is experiencing sig a pretty significant third wave activity right now, and we've been paying attention to this indicator in particular. Um, and Fulton County is the county that contains um, Atlanta, Georgia, and we have some friends in the CDC that we collaborate with. And so I just put this picture together to compare. For example, um, the percentage of people who know somebody else with COVID symptoms in their local community as a function of time. And I'll talk more about this indicator just a little bit later. And the last example I wanted to show as we marked on the severity pyramid goes all the way down to the population level um, behavior, essentially, you know, important different behavioral aspects of the population, and that's mask use. Another indicator we compute based on our survey um, that, as far as we know, is not available, uh, you know, in any kind of continual sense across time at, at this geographic resolution. So here I'm just showing it, um, you know, essentially aggregated by state. And we can see that there's quite interesting behavior. Um, first of all, there's a huge spread in, in self-reported mask use. And so for example, in DC, you know, basically all the way since we started um, running the survey with this question, we added this question to the survey in, in September, we see that like over 95% of people report that they wear a mask most or all of the time in public, which is pretty incredible. Um, all the way down to, you know, for example, Wyoming or South Dakota, which are, are south of 60% of the time in public back in September. But in these states, we've seen a steady kind of um, uptick in mask and self-reported mask, mask use. And so now they're closer to 80%. Okay, um, I wanna very quickly talk about revisions. So um, as Ronnie mentioned, our, we not only store, you know, the current values of all of our indicators, but also a full historical um, set of revisions. So I, I wanted to talk about one parameter that our, that our API essentially exposes. Um, there are others, but this is probably the most intuitive, which is as of. 
So anytime you pull any indicator at any date, you can ask that, that indicator at that date as of, as of a particular time. And the way you can think about it is imagine you had a time machine and you sent yourself back in time to the as of date and you, were, you would have called the API on that date. That's what you would have gotten in terms of the data that we return. And without um, specifying as of, it's always as of the current date, the date that you're, uh, which you're, you're, you're actually making the, the API call. So this is very important because um, many data streams in public and you know, essentially public health surveillance are subject to revisions. Uh, and I'm just gonna jump to an example uh, rather than kind of walk through some details of really how significant this can be and how it can, how it can affect, for example, um, forecaster development and forecaster evaluation. And this example, I, I have to credit um, Jacob um, Bien, who's a, a faculty member who works with the Delphi group uh, who, who, who came up with this example. So let's look at the last two weeks of August in California. Okay, and let's suppose we're interested in forecasting, um, you know, let's say the number of new cases per day for some horizon out into the future. Um, and we were interested in using, for example, the doctor's visit signal as a feature in a forecaster that we were developing, which makes sense, right, intuitively, because we would expect um, that, you know, people would be coming to the doctor uh, with COVID symptoms, possibly um, before or at the same time that they were actually going to get tested um, for COVID. And because, uh, you know, their tests are basically reported at a delay, um, there might be value in using this as a feature in a, in a forecaster for, um, you know, incident cases. So let's suppose I, I had this model that I built and I, now I want to see how it did. Okay. And I, I said, let me pretend like I didn't see any data past September 1st. I'm going to train the forecaster on data up until September 1st. And then I'll retrospectively, you know, see how I did by making, you know, true forecasts after September 1st and comparing it to the truth. And so this is what the, the doctor's visit signal looks like, um, you know, in the period uh, leading up to September 1st. However, this is what it looked like as of the end of September. So if you were at the end of September running this experiment, this is what you would have seen. That's not really what's relevant for this evaluation. What's relevant is actually what it would have looked like as of the forecast date, which in this case is September 1st, right? So if we're going to be running honest or fair um, retrospective evaluation, we actually have to be able, we have to actually have to have the ability to pull signals or pull features or pull the response, all, all the required information for, for model training as of the time at which we've been making this hypothetical forecast. And if you look at the doctor's visit signal as of September 1st, it looks very different um, for two reasons. First is it's actually available at a higher latency. So uh, it's lagged by an additional three days past what we would have seen uh, at the end of September. And this is just because it takes time for medical claims to be assimilated and for us to get them into our API. Um, the second is more troublesome, which is that actually the, the signal itself looks really different. It's, it's consistently biased upwards across uh, this period. And if we were to query the, the API at intermediate as of dates, we can see that it kind of, it'll slowly converge down to uh, where it looked like at the, at the end of September, but there's still a significant historical revision pattern that we have to pay attention to. In this particular case, um, what happened was that uh, the medical claims that got submitted late or processed late and eventually found their way uh, into our database and we eventually you know, would pick them up and update our indicator, um, they actually were contributing to the denominator in this fraction, right? These are um, essentially COVID related visits divided by total visits. And so we can see that the initial estimate is biased upwards because the ones that were being submitted late were actually the ones that were not attributed or not related to COVID. So an extremely important thing to pay attention to in modeling is, is revisions. Okay, um, I really did not leave myself very much time to talk about the symptom surveys. I wanted to give a kind of an overview of the data and the API. I think I'm going to try to finish in five minutes still um, and then turn it over to questions and happy to talk about you know, really anything in the Q&A period and just give a, a highlight of the symptom surveys and maybe jump very quickly to the, to the kind of the forecast demo. So since April, we've been running a, a, a survey, um, which is ongoing. We, you know, we get new, new uh, respondents taking the survey every day. And at this point, it averages about 50,000 people per day and over, over 14 million, approaching 15 million at this point since it began in April. And this survey is run um, on CMU's side, but is advertised through Facebook. And 
It has a number of questions that we ask um, the respondents to answer uh, on things like, for example, COVID symptoms, both common and rare, COVID testing, mental health, social contacts and behavior, and demographics. Um, the, the, the survey is about 35 questions long. Um, and it's, it was designed initially to aid now casting and forecasting, but very early on um, through the encouragement of basically different collaborators surrounding the survey, um, we, we kind of uh, were pushed to make the survey much broader and to be a tool to understand how the pandemic is affecting people um, in a very broad sense, not just uh, in a way that would kind of contribute to an increase in accuracy of now casts or forecasts. So the survey is actually quite broad. I just wanted to make that, um, to emphasize that point. And there's a parallel international survey being run by the University of Maryland, which is currently deployed in, in over uh, 100 countries and translated um, across 55 languages. And it's, it's very closely uh, kind of synced with, with the US survey that we run. And, uh, you know, along with the University of Maryland and, and other researchers, both of these surveys have gone through multiple um, updates. We, we've actually released, I think, five waves of the survey since it began in April. So we're continually looking for new questions to add, new things to learn. Um, I'm going to skip this part. Um, I'll just highlight that uh, if you're interested in, in uh, access to the raw survey data, so individual um, de-identified survey responses, then you can get access if you're at a, an academic institution or a nonprofit by signing a data use agreement. So I'm gonna um, highlight two indicators that we compute. Um, very, these are kind of the most basic indicators we compute from the survey data, which have to do with self-reported symptoms. The first is what we call percent CLI, the percentage of people who are um, experiencing COVID-like illness, which is defined as a fever, along with cough, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing. And the second is CLI in community, percentage CLI in community, which is the percentage of people who report that they know somebody else with COVID-like illness in their community. So you might ask, why do we ask uh, on the survey a person to answer on symptoms of others? Why don't we just have them report on themselves? And uh, the, the, the reason is that actually this proxy, this proxy question um, actually tends to be much less noisy and very informative even beyond asking people to report on their own symptoms. And there's many ways in which we, we've seen this um, exemplified as we've been working with the survey data since April, but here's just one very basic way. I'm showing you correlation between uh, each of these two signals, percent CLI and percent CLI in community, along with um, current uh, daily new cases at the county level. And these are correlations sliced by time. So at every point in time, I look at um, you know, what the signal values are across all of the counties in which we have data. I look at the, the, the um, incident case rates across all of those counties. And I look at the correlations between those two vectors, right? So one entry per county. And here I'm actually looking at Spearman correlation. So it's the correlation between ranks answering the question, you know, the counties which um, have high case rates tend to also have uh, you know, people reporting high percent a high percentage of people self-reporting that they have COVID-like illness or, or a high percentage CLI in community? And the answer is yes for both signal, but it's, it's overwhelmingly um, more so the case for the CLI in community signal. The, the correlation is actually kind of hovering around 0.8 for most of the pandemic. Um, there's lots in the survey beyond symptom data. Um, I just will kind of highlight the, the here quickly in a bullet point, um, some of the other indicators, like we asked people, for example, uh, if they've been tested in the last 14 days and we, we can create indicators broken down by age and occupation. We asked people, for example, if they wanted to get a test but couldn't be tested. Uh, we asked people what types of activities they do outside their homes. We asked people whether they um, wear you know, masks, you know, sometimes, often, or all the time in public, or also to answer the same question about others in the, in the community. And we ask people about various um, mental health uh, questions like anxiety, depression, and isolation. So I'm gonna have to skip the, the, the mask demo. So I'm, I think I wanna quit. Um, I'm going to maybe just leave the forecasting demo for a Q and A question if somebody's curious to see it. But I'll just say that, I'll just describe what it is. The, uh, the forecasting demo just uh, was trying to look at the value added by the survey signals on top of 
you know, let's say a basic autoregressive forecaster that didn't have access to the service signal. So I'm going to skip ahead to the end and just wrap up um, and uh, summarize that you know the, the the what we're calling the COVID cast ecosystem has many parts. Lorne and I focused really in large part on the data in this talk, which um, you know is is some of the more unique aspects to our work. But there's a lot that we're working on beyond that, and we're, we'd be very happy to to answer questions on any of it. Uh, and the last thing I'll, I'll say is that you know. We didn't build this just for ourselves. We built this for the community to use. Um, we really strongly believe that, you know, take an entire community of, of, of researchers, both in data science and in public health to find answers to all of the important questions. So um, please join our community. Please, you know, take a look at the data, take a look at the packages and show us all the interesting things that we can learn from it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Ryan and Roni. Um, so there's, there's lots of questions. Maybe we'll start with the one that Ryan asked uh, about why the spike at the end of November. Um, a few people said um, maybe people went to get tested just before Thanksgiving. Others said um, maybe they're going to get a flu shot um, around Thanksgiving. So what's the answer? That, that, that's what we have, Ryan. I don't know if other people have ideas, but the, I guess the main one was that people, we thought people were going to get Good to get tested before traveling. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's. Um, I think that those are all in the right direction, which is that uh, holidays basically um, lead to different behaviors in medical seeking behavior, um, or different patterns of medical seeking behavior. So I'm not sure I would have identified those particular answers, but I, I would have said that you know people tend not to go to the doctor. Um, around Thanksgiving unless it's for something that they really, really need to go in, go in for. And so that's why you see uh, a spike in um, doctor's visits that were re related to COVID because the denominator basically is a lot smaller there than in a normal period. Most people just don't wanna go in over the Thanksgiving weekend, right? So a higher fraction of those doctor's visits over that weekend are actually related to COVID than it would be, for example, in the previous weekend. And so this is what we call a holiday effect, and it affects the, the claims indicators strongly, something that we have to pay attention to. And, and like revisions, we have to take into account for any model, any models that we build. But it's not just medical claims indicators. It's actually also public health reporting, which is what I think maybe people are also somewhat alluding to, um, which is that you, know, you see that a very disturbing dip in confirmed cases and confirmed deaths over the Thanksgiving weekend as well, which we know is, is artificial. It's just a reporting artifact. It's not like, for example, for some magical reason that weekend, we just, we're all faring better in terms of the pandemic. Okay, so there's a couple of questions about CDC. Um, one person asked, do you contribute forecast to the COVID forecast hub? Another person asked, is, there CDC, is CDC utilizing your code and data in any way to shape their policy? So can you, can you repeat the first question about the COVID hub? This asks, do you contribute forecasts to the COVID forecast hub? We do. Um, we've been uh, we've been contributing forecasts to the to the hub since uh, about midsummer or maybe early summer, um, and more so than that, we we as one of the two centers of excellence, we kind of um, help advise the 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 structure of of forecast scoring and ensembling. So we we've been working on the ensemble along with Nick Reich's group, um, the other center of excellence um, for the entire period, the ensemble that is formed out of the individual submissions to the COVID hub. Um, I'm gonna let Ronnie answer the question about whether or not um, folks are using our data for, for, uh, for any purpose, but I guess particularly for policy. Uh, I didn't see the question, but is this a, about using a forecast or using our indicators? I believe it was the latter. So uh, yeah, we do not keep track of everybody who, in fact, we don't keep track of anybody who's using our indicators. They're open and we don't request registration or anything like that, but we do have anecdotal evidence, uh, mostly from when our system is down, we start getting complaints. So uh, we are aware of uh, public health officials in the DOD who are using it to form their estimates uh, on a regular basis. We've been in touch with some of them. We're aware of some um, financial planning organizations on uh, Wall Street who um, routinely consult our indicators in, in deriving their, their analysis. 
And of course, uh, CDC is our main uh, uh, client. They use our forecast, as, as Ryan mentioned, and they combine it with forecast from other groups to create an ensemble, which is then used to inform their own decision makers, uh, as well as to inform the public. They, they put it up, up there. Okay, um, maybe you can, if you can get a chance to talk about the forecasting uh, methods, Ryan, maybe you can talk a little bit about the methods that Delphi is using and uh, are using ser ser type uh, mechanistic models or more more database models. And I also wonder maybe there's an analogy maybe in machine learning where um, models or techniques based on large amounts of training data like uh, Google Translate, for example, have um, surpassed the ones that are based on more traditional me mechanistic modeling. Do you think there's an analogy here that with the, kind of the great data you collected, maybe more empirical models will turn out to be as or more useful than SIR models? Roni, did you want to take a stab at that or would you like me to? Uh, either way. <laughs> Go for it. Okay, so um, SIR models are great scientifically, but uh, have not been proven uh, that accurate uh, technologically. So what do I mean by that? Um, they are a very good way to understand the mechanism of how epidemics spread. As far as track record of forecasting, um, uh, of course you can't build a track record for a pandemic, it's a one-off thing, but we do have a track record of about seven years of forecasting flu. And the lessons we learned from that is that the uh, non-mechanistic models, at least so far, have been on average more accurate than the mechanistic ones, the SIR, SAR, and so forth. Um, those of you who know the mechanistic models know that they are very oversimplistic in terms of the assumptions they make about the, the, the transmission mode and the, and the patterns of transmission. Um, so while they're useful, uh, if you're focusing on the accuracy and on track record, they have not been proven as useful as the data-driven ones. Now, if you had a lot more data uh, it stands to reason that actually the, the machine learning methods would have an advantage uh, relative to the mechanistic ones. The more data you have, the less you need to rely on, on assumptions. Um, the flip side of it is in a pandemic, uh, the data-driven methods are uh, at a huge disadvantage because um, most of our models have been trained on 20 years of flu. And when you come to, uh, to COVID, you have a few months worth and, and uh, uh, you're in very difficult situations. This is why you see a proliferation of the SAR models uh, for the pandemic, because there's so little data to base it on. Okay. Ryan, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I, I would say that um, I am, am in complete agreement. I would just maybe add the uh, kind of small addendum that we have seen SAR models in the pandemic doing relatively better at short-term forecasting than we have seen them uh, in, let's say, you know, seasonal flu forecasting um, for the, basically for the reason that, that Roni was alluding to, which is that they require, um, you know, less history essentially uh, for training compared to basic, you know, let's say statistical methods out of time series or machine learning. So it, it's very hard to answer the question Dad, that, that was raised about a pandemic because you know, by definition, we don't know whether this pandemic will inform the next one at all, and probably um, it won't. But, you know, the, the Cisco machine learning um, kind of approach will eventually, at least we, we believe based on, you know, the kind of the, our work in flu, will eventually catch up and surpass mechanistic models for epidemic forecasting. Let me add to this that I think the future belongs to a third class of models, which are hybrid between the two, uh, which are really the, uh, the dominant um, mode in weather forecasting. These are data assimilation methods. Uh, so uh, starting from some like common filter or particle filtering type of models, but uh, imbuing them with a lot more uh, process model. So do use the SIR or SAR uh, as, as a base, but don't take it too seriously and uh, adjust it to, to measurements. Uh, this is uh, really how all of weather forecasting works. And I think this is probably how uh, epidemic forecasting will work in the future. Okay, uh, there's a, now there's a question about the uh, survey data. Is there a selection or voluntary bias in the survey data since the data set is from social media? And if there is such a bias, are you adjusting for it? Is it representative? That's a great question. Um, so 
the recruitment text that Facebook uses uh, in order to recruit people to take the survey tries to um, recruit the broadest swath of participants possible by saying that, you know, even if you're healthy, uh, you know, your answers will contribute to an, an improvement in tracking and forecasting. Um, and it does a, a good job of basically encouraging participation. That said, of course, there is, um, you know, respondent bias. Um, and we, we basically receive every day um, a set of importance weights that, that Facebook calculates and passes to us to try to adjust for this. So they have models that estimate the probability that any given person they show the survey will actually take it um, based on, you know, whether, for example, they've clicked on past surveys that are similar or, or other kind of features that we don't have access to, um, you know, being completely external to Facebook. And so we use these as importance weights to adjust for survey bias. Um, it's of course impossible to say whether or not, uh, you know, this is really adjusting for bias completely because as I alluded to already, most of the things we're measuring, you can't find elsewhere. So we have no ground truth. Um, that said, we can still do things like check for self-consistency um, uh, between you know, answers on the survey. Uh, and also we can, um, we can look at whether or not we believe the survey bias is constant across time and space by seeing, for example, whether models that are um, fit globally across time and space do as well as models that allow for kind of departures between different locations and different points in time. And from what we can tell, it looks like that the survey bias is uh, substantial, but is probably, it, it looks to be, um, you know, relatively constant across time and space. And so if you're using the, um, the survey signals in order to, uh, to look at temporal variation or spatial variation, then they still could be very, um, informative, whether or not you believe the numbers they're reporting, you know, in an absolute sense are, are biased. So uh, since a lot of the people in the audience are probably st are statisticians, maybe graduate students um, who are looking for research problems, do, in this experience, do, do you see some opportunities for um, some low hanging fruit for, for, for research in, in this area, uh, a place where there's real need for some new, new statistical modeling or approaches? Great question. Um, hard question too. I think that there's a ton. Um, just trying to identify a few. I'll maybe I'll maybe say a few, and then Roni, please uh, jump in. So, um, I think uh, one extremely important problem, which I I, I personally believe is is um, kind of underserved in terms of, of statistical modeling, is the problem of now casting. Um, most of the attention um, throughout the course of this pandemic has been on forecasting of various flavors, you know, some, some counterfactual forecasting or some short-term factual forecasting, the latter being the category that we work on. But there are many, many good forecast models for short-term prediction at this point. Um, there are not enough, I think, people working on now casting. And so I'll define what that is um, very quickly. So um, anything you see in terms of public health reporting is delayed. So um, when, for example, uh, you know, case numbers or death numbers get put up on a county's dashboard and then get scraped by, for example, Johns Hopkins CSSC group, they're actually assimilated by um, date of report. But those, the, the tests that, um, you know, basically were reported that day could have been performed any number of days earlier. The median delay at this point, based on, um, you know, what we know about from Florida's line list is somewhere around seven days, but there's a huge tail. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, there's, there's a delay of three or four weeks. So at its most basic, um, now casting tries to perform a deconvolution, which says that um, how many uh, individuals do we expect, uh, you know, are are present in the population at, at a given point in time, say today, who are actually symptomatically infected and will eventually show up in our testing stream and be reported. So it tries to undo two things, both the delay in reporting and also the delay between symptom onset and um, test seeking behavior. And um, it's an incredibly important problem to solve because you know, otherwise we're looking at everything 10 to 15 days late. So even what we, what we believe are, are kind of real time surveillance streams are actually telling us about things that are 10 to 15 days in the future, uh, in the past. Uh, and for that, this is a problem where I think 
um, having access to multiple indicators like the ones we built can be really um, uh, very fruitful because they're all kind of weak proxies for measuring, you can imagine for measuring um, you know, prevalence in some way. And methodologically compared to forecasting, I think this is more wide open. I think this problem is, is less studied and, and hence more wide open. Roni, do you have any other thoughts? Yes. Um, first, let me reinforce that now casting is really super important and under undersolved problem. Uh, and it has different characteristics in terms of estimation and modeling than forecasting, because you don't need to worry about the dynamics of spread. What you're, what you're studying and trying to, <clears throat> to invert is not the dynamics of spread of the epidemic, but rather the dynamics of reporting, as in the examples that Ryan gave. Uh, given some latent level of spread in any one location, how does that manifest in all the different kind of uh, measurements that we have, all the proxy data sources that we have, including time convolution and, and delayed reporting and so forth. But I wanna to point to another, what I think is a big open problem that I would love to have dozens of people working on. Um, so this I have to um, first <clears throat> preface and say that a lot of our effort in forecasting is, uh, is focused on uh, distributional forecasts as opposed to point forecast. That point did not come uh, uh, so up so, so far in the talk, but it's really central to what we do. Um, we believe, as do our users of CDC and others, that it's important not just to give your best bet of what the cases or hospitalizations or deaths will be a few weeks from now, but also what is the likely distribution of cases or deaths or hospitalization a few weeks from now. So not only give a, a point your best guess, but say how likely different outcomes are because many decisions are based uh, on uh, risk taking and risk minimization and you really need to know what the tail distribution is for different eventualities. And uh, distributional forecasts are significantly harder to combine than point forecasts. So I'll give you an example. Suppose you had a point forecast for all 50 states uh, for average deaths per, per capita. It's a trivial matter to convert it into a national forecast of average deaths per capita or, or regional or any level you want. But if you have distributional um, forecasts, combining them is difficult because the correlations between them becomes not very significant. Whereas if you look at the mean, you know, it's an expected expectation is linear. You don't need to worry about the correlation. So um, if you derive distributional forecast for every state in the union, and you then uh, want to convert it into a national forecast, it's not clear how to do that. You need to make some assumptions about the correlation structure. Um, and that happens not just in geographic aggregation, but also in other kinds of aggregation. If you build distributional forecasts for different age groups, and you now want to combine them to see what the total uh, distribution would be in the population, you have the same problem. If you break it down by different types of disease, in the case of flu, different subtypes and so forth. So this problem comes up a lot in, in distributional forecast. And we, we think there are many, many solutions to explore here and we don't have a good one yet. So related to all that is one person asks, is there a place that uh, they can read about the methods that are being used for now casting and forecasting? Is there, are they a Rima regression, Box Jenkins, machine learning methods, serum models? Can you, can you uh, tell us now or maybe put in the, in the materials some places that people can read to see what methods are being used? Um, I, I wish I could say that we've written a blog post on it because we've been planning to do so for a little while. I'm just behind. I wanted to write a review of kind of forecasting methodology. Um, so the very kind of cursory overview is, yeah, some very basic time series models, you know, basic, you know, uh, fan, like a slightly fancy variants of autoregression are, are um, popular, but they have, but as Roni alluded to, you know, in the, they should be distributional. That's the standard currently in the community and it's what is accepted in the COVID hub. Um, then there are mechanistic models, which are, you can think of them as um, linearizations of the SAR model. So most people don't actually fit, you know, the full SAR differential equation globally across time. They fit it locally and some people even will linearize the dynamics and fit that locally. So that's another kind of popular class of model. And then there's a bunch of stuff in between um, that, you know, for example, we'll, we'll take the residuals from a simple time series model and we'll try to do something fancy on the residuals that account for, you know, 
spatial correlation or maybe other kind of patterns that uh, you know may have been missed by the time series model. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll mention one final class of models, which are called agent-based models, which are still popular among a couple of groups, which are very essentially very, very kind of fine-grained comp com complex simulation models, um, which attempt to make the dynamics, you know, um, basically much more realistic on top of the, me on top of the mechanistic models. Um, and the best place to read about this, I guess I would say if you go to the um, COVID hub, um, this is Nick Reich's group's um, website. If you go to, um, there should be a, a, a kind of tab on that website that lists the teams. Each team gives like a one paragraph blurb about what they are doing. And if you're interested, you can probably click through and, and read there. Most teams have some kind of preprint or something available if you click through. Um, but I think you'll see there that like the local localized SAR models or local linearizations of the SR models are really overwhelmingly the most popular at this point. If you go to the um, kind of about page of the COVID hub. For now casting, it's much more sparse. Um, there's really only, you know, a handful, a couple methods that exist. Um, I would suggest, for example, reading um, some of the some of the documentation around epiforecast.io, another um, group we collaborate with, the Sebastian Funks group, uh, and they've they've written I think at least one paper on now casting for COVID nineteen, so you could take a look there. But that but it's like I said, there's really it's really more wide open methodologically. Um, since we only got a couple minutes left, um, maybe a general question. Um, if you knew what you knew now, say um, in March, what might you have done differently? And how do you see this whole project evolving in the future? Is it going to be useful for future pandemics or are there, are there other challenges in public health that this, this system will be useful for? What's your, what's your longer vision? Tony, go ahead. So our vision uh, hasn't really changed much since 2012. We still believe that there's a huge opportunity uh, in creating a epi epidemiological forecasting capability uh, that would be comparable to weather forecasting in terms of its usefulness and acceptability. What has changed is that the whole world now sees that. Um, where for the first seven years we were stomping and, and uh, saying this is important and we have to do it. Uh, the pandemic has now educated everybody, educated the public, educated the government, so I think we're closer to it being a reality now than we've ever been before, thanks to this painful, very painful lesson. As far as what we have created, uh, all along our goal was not a particular pandemic. It was an ongoing operational system uh, and, and um, expanding to as many diseases and epidemics as we can. Uh, there's one system we built back in 2016 for um, now, real time now casting of influenza it's still operational now. It's running in almost automatic mode and it's uh, updated twice a week. Um, so uh, this is how we envision the future. Uh, maybe not just our group, but more groups and eventually a, a semi-governmental organization that, that runs this on, a, on an operational level and then leaves academia to work on improvements and on value-added um, value uh, solutions. Okay, uh, Ryan, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I, I, I'm going to ask James, should we keep going or stop? Or you're, you're muted. I think we probably should wrap it up. There are a lot more questions, I realize, but uh, uh, we will put the video and the uh, the uh, the whole slide deck for people who want to work through that and get more details uh, that will be on the website and if you go to news by tomorrow you'll be, have access to the uh, to the video also. Are there any burning questions though, Rob? Uh, you want to ask? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, there are, there are a lot more specific questions in the Q and A, and I'm sure Ryan and Roni, who get way too much email, uh, would be happy to try to answer things by email. Um, there's nothing else really to burning that I have here on my list. So. Well, let me let me thank uh, Ronnie, Ronnie and Rob for uh, this great. Uh, and Ryan, Ryan. Yes, and uh, sorry about that. Yes, and Rob for getting back on. Uh, 
after a delay. And uh, for the attendees, thank you for attending. And we will have another uh, in this series on January 7. And uh, check our website for upcoming events. There'll be uh, a series of these. Thank you again. Thank you.